Amen. How many of us can honestly say that we want more of God? I tell you what, the wanting more of God is never a bad thing. I'll say this. Expecting more of God is not a bad thing. See, when I begin to think about expectations and expecting something out of somebody, in order for me to expect something out of anybody, I've got to have the faith on the back end that they can deliver on what I want them to do, right? i got to have the faith that they can perform what I am expecting of them. And I want you to know this morning that you were, if you were expecting more of God, He's got the ability, He's got the power to come through for you. Keep expecting. See, when we come into this place with expectations that God is going to move, God won't let us down. God won't let us down. But as I said earlier, it takes action on our parts. See, that's why when you read that book of Acts, that's why it's called Acts. Because those people, they acted on something that had been told to them, that had been commanded to them. But not only that, they acted in faith on something that had been promised years ago. Years ago. And I want you to know that if God promised you something years ago, don't stop acting on your faith. Stand on it. Claim it. Continue to seek it. And I promise you, in God's time, see that's, that's the catch. And that's the thing that's tough for us is that we don't have the patience a lot of times with God to allow Him to do it on His time. Me and my brother Philip back there, brother, it's great to have you this morning. Philip lives in Alabama, and um, we got to talking. We got to talking yesterday at, at Sharon's graduation party about the the fact that there's so many times that that we try to make things happen, that we try to do something, and sometimes we justify it in our heads as, well, you know, what I don't want to bother God with this. He's got too much going on. I want you to know. If you say that God's got too much going on, then you don't have the faith in Him that you need to have. Because there is nothing, there is not one single thing that God doesn't care about that you've got going on. I don't care how small it is, how big it is, He cares about it. He cares about you and He loves you. And He wants to see you prosper. We serve a God that wants to see us prosper. I say it a lot of times around here. We don't serve no El Chipo God. We serve the God of El Shaddai. I serve a God of more than enough. And He's got overflow for your life. I was talking to somebody this past weekend. I went to a, a guy that I work with. His son is going on a, a mission trip to Africa. And they did a little fundraiser for him. And, and I went out there on, on Sunday afternoon. And, and they had been there for I think three or four hours and they had a goal in mind that they were, were trying to reach. And we had, I had been there for probably about maybe an hour, hour 15 minutes or something like that. And my buddy Robbie, he comes up to me and he says, hey brother, I got awesome news. And I said, what's going on? He said, he said, we reached our goal. He said, we just hit our goal. And I looked at him, I said, that's awesome. I said, but God's not done. I, I serve the God that when he fed the 5,000 that he still had 12 baskets left over. He still had leftover for his people. And I told him, I said, he's not done yet. There's going to be overflow. There's going to be leftover. And it wasn't long after that that we had to leave. And I got a call from him later on that night. He said, brother, he said, I want to let you know that he said, we were kind of stuck on that, on what we had taken in. And we hit that goal. We were stuck on it for a couple of hours. He said, but right before we shut everything down, somebody came 
And, in, and they gave more. He said, we ended up raising about $2,000 where they were trying to raise $1,500. And I told him, I said, that's the overflow that God has promised us. <laughs> See, God doesn't want to just meet your needs. God wants to exceed your needs. That's the God that we serve. And I'm so thankful for him. If you've got your Bibles with you this morning, I'm going to be coming out of Acts chapter 1. And if y'all don't mind standing for the initial reading of God's Word, I'd appreciate that. Thank you, Brother Patrick. Hey, well, let's give Brother Patrick a hand. He does it. <laughs> he can really tickle them things up there. Woo. Sounds good. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5 here. It says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. See, here in this passage, God's given some instructions. Jesus has given instructions here to these people. And it says, being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Not to depart. But there's a word that they use that's kind of an older word that we don't use it very much nowadays. But he wanted them to tarry. He wanted them to remain. He wanted them to stay. He wanted them to stand firm. Now, this is after Jesus has already been crucified. He's already risen from the grave. He's already, of course, appeared to them. And he's walking around and, and he's still doing works and things like that. But he's about to leave. He's about to go. And see, there was a concern inside of the following that once he left, that, that that protection that was there with him, that covering, so to speak, was going to go with him. And they were going to be left there. Because see, in Jerusalem, specifically in the town of Jerusalem, there was a, a big group of people that were going after the disciples. That were going after followers of Jesus. And, and they wanted to kill them. They wanted to see them killed as well. And so that's why. That there was probably something inside of them. That says okay. When he gets out of here. We're going to. Right. When he's gone. We've got to go somewhere. But Jesus tells them right here. Not only does he tell them. It says he commanded them. There's a particular verse in the Bible that says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Right. It's as simple as that. If you love him, you will keep his commandments. Whatever he says, you will do without question. He commanded them not to depart for Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Now, we just talked about that word, but that's a tough one right there, right? Wait. It's tough to be in the middle of waiting because especially with us, we want something done right now, right then. We've got everything right there at our fingertips. You know, if you don't know something, you can just, you don't even have to punch it into Google anymore. You can just, just ask Siri. You know? and, and she'll begin to talk to you and, and she'll tell you exactly what you want to know. See, they had to wait. I want you to know that anything good is worth the wait. Am I right? Anything good is worth the wait. It says they were to wait for the promise of the Father, which, he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. This morning we're going to talk about that day of Pentecost and that initial outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And what it meant back then and what it still means today for his church. Not our church, not just Mount Pleasant, but for his church. 
for churches all over the world, for every church. Let's pray this morning. God, we just thank you, dear Lord, for this word that's about to come forth. God, I pray that it would be your word, not my word. God, I pray that you would speak to your people here this morning, God. Jesus, that you would open eyes, that you would open, open minds, dear God, and open hearts so that we can receive you greater than we ever have. God, just as that song says this morning, God, we pray that you would set a fire within our soul, God, because we do want more of you. God, we need more of you. And God, I pray, dear God, that you would just minister to needs that are in this house this morning. God, I pray that you would just touch an addiction, touch in brokenness. God, remove change in this place this morning. But God, most importantly, I pray that you would remove the bondage that's around our minds, God. God, that, that greatest battle that we'll ever face is inside of our heads. God, I pray that you would just begin to remove those, those things that have got us bound, dear God. And God, I pray, dear Lord, that you would be glorified in everything said this morning. And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated in this house this morning. You know, Jesus told the following here. He said, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And I remember, I remember when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and he asked, he said, you know, what, what should I do to enter into the kingdom of heaven? And he said, you know, you, you've got to be born again. You've got to be born again. And it began to kind of make him wonder, you know, well, what does it mean to be born again? You know, Am I supposed to enter into the womb, you know, a second time? That's not what it's about. See, Jesus told him, he said, surely, he said, unless you, unless you are born of the water and of the spirit, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. The water and the spirit. See, we need God's spirit working inside of us. See, it's, it's great to go into that water and be baptized and take on his name. And that's why a lot of times when, when, when they talk about baptisms, they call that a water grave. Why do they call it a water grave? Because when you go down in there, you're leaving that old, dead, sinful life behind you. And you're coming up, as it says in Corinthians, a new creation in Christ. A new creature. You're not the same anymore. And guess what? If we're not the same anymore, then we shouldn't be doing the same things that we always did, right? We shouldn't be saying the same old words that we always said. Because God has made us into something new. Now, how many of y'all, let's, let's, ben, ben and I'm not trying to embarrass you this morning, but Ben got a new truck uh, here this past week. And I guarantee you the first thing that Bennett did with his new truck is find the biggest mud hole that he could find and he ran it right through it, right? And then you got out and you stomped around in the mud and then you got back in the truck and trapped mud in the truck, right? No, not at all. In fact, I guarantee you, you've probably been doing everything you can to try and keep it clean, right? Exactly. Because it's new. See, when we become something new after we come up from that water, we don't need to go back to the same old mud hole that we came from. We don't need to go back to the same old life of sin that God has brought us out of. But we need to do everything we can to try to remain clean. Now, here's the thing. Throughout this walk, there's going to be times that you're going to get a little dirty. It's going to happen. You just got to clean yourself off and keep on going. Clean yourself off. Sometimes, if you get involved in something too heavily, there's nothing wrong with being rebaptized. Because, you know, we go through different things in this life, different struggles. I want you to know that I was baptized when I was 14 years old. And I knew exactly what baptism was all about, I knew why I was being baptized. I knew that I wanted to take on the name of Jesus Christ. I knew all that. But then you fast forward from that point in time of 14 through high school, 
through college, and even through the beginning parts of my marriage. I had gone through some things. I had been to some places that had dirted me up a little bit. And I was ready to get re-cleansed. I was ready for a fresh anointing to be in my life. And so at 28 years old, I got back into those waters and I was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And I'm not ashamed of it. So you can try all you want to, Bennett, to keep that truck clean, but at some point it's going to come dirty and you're going to have to wash it again. You're going to have to wash it. But see, that's our job to make sure that this vessel is clean and that we are ready for proper use in God's kingdom. If you want to be used this morning, if you want more of God, then you've got to be able to cleanse yourself from the inside out and open yourself up so that God can pour something new inside of you. But see, the problem is, is so many times we fill our lives with all this pointless junk and it begins to take up space where God could be pouring into us. Where God could be filling us with that spirit that he's, he's promised us. See, we, we might not know it right now, but we are fighting spiritual warfare. Yes. And I said it the other day when I was talking to somebody. I said, you can't fight spiritual battles without spiritual weapons. Right. You can't. And if we try to, we're not going to be successful. But here's the, the real part is that God is not expecting us to fight all of our spiritual battles anyways. He wants to fight the battle for us. He wants to go before us. So that we don't have to fight. See there's so many of us that are, that are so stressed out. And, and worried to the max. And, and we've got all this anxiety built up inside of us. Because we're trying to make things work on our own. And we're trying to do this and do that. And God's just saying just give it to me. Let me do it. Let me fight it. Let me go before you. You know, it's important that when you when you talk about an actual physical war, that you're prepared. I was talking to somebody the other day, you know, my Bible tells me about the, the armor of God. The armor of God. And we'll, we'll do some you know teaching and studying on that later on down the line. But I want you to know that that armor of God is there for a reason. And, and so many people, they've got this idea where, you know what, God's got me. I'm just going to go out there and I'm just going to do my own thing. Not without the armor of God, you better not. It's not a sign of weak faith to put on the armor of God. Because that armor of God was put there to protect you. To protect you. God wants to protect us. He doesn't want to see us get hurt. So don't think that you're beyond putting on the armor of God. You know, so many people want to walk out there and like, well, well, Superman didn't wear armor. You know what? Superman can do what he wants to. But my Bible, you know, Superman's a story. It's a myth. You want to talk about Superman? He hung on that cross right there. That's my Superman. That's my Superman. He wasn't wearing any armor either when he got on that cross. But guess what? He's the son of God. That's right. And see, God has called us to be a, a vessel yeah. that we can have Jesus living inside of us. Right. But when you've got something that valuable, you want to protect it, right? You want to protect it. If you want to jump back on to the whole you know, truck and car issue, one of the big things right now is everybody's doing this thing called ceramic coating on their cars. And, and what it does is it puts that that film, that, that coat on there, and then when you get mud and stuff on the truck, you can literally take a garden hose and, and wash it off. It'll just, just fall off. It doesn't stick as well. And it helps you keep the, the vehicle more clean. See, God is looking for us with that armor of God. He wants us to coat ourselves with that armor of God so we can protect what is so valuable that he's poured inside of us. 
Because see, the devil, it, my Bible says he will come like a thief in the night. That he's, he's roaming around. He's, he's looking for somebody that he can devour. And what he wants to do is he wants to have surprise attacks. Surprise attacks. Because see, he knows when he tries to come at us face to face, we can call on Jesus' name. He can come in and fight the battle for us and it's over. Once Jesus is involved, that's it. But here's the issue is that there's so many people, there's so many Christians, there's so many churches that are out there and they're asleep. And the devil's coming in at nighttime and he's, he's got surprise attacks for them. You know, this is Memorial Day weekend, so we're going to talk about this for a second. And a lot of people know this story. But on December 7th, 1941, Japan launched a devastating surprise attack on the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor. And thousands of American soldiers and civilians were killed. The Pacific Fleet suffered crippling losses of ships and airplanes. And to make matters worse, as the war progressed, it became evident that the Japanese knew every move the United States military was going to make before they made it. Imagine fighting a battle where your enemy knew every single thing that you were about to do before you did it. He was one step ahead of you at all times. It says, the problem was that many Japanese soldiers had been educated in American schools and spoke fluent English. And since they knew our language, they could easily decode our military orders and set up plans to defeat our troops. And they were destroying us. Then William Johnston, a civil engineer and a World War I veteran, had this idea. What if we used the Navajo language for our orders? What if we used a language so rare and unique that the enemy could not decode it? So the U.S. military recruited native, Nav native Navajos to send and receive coded messages using the Navajo language. The enemy tried, but they couldn't break the code. And then the tide turned in the war. We started winning battles. And as most of you know, we won the war. And these brave Navajo men were called wind talkers. Wind talkers. Remember that. And their unknown language turned into a secret weapon that was a huge part of defeating the enemy and bringing victory. I want you to know this morning that some of you that sit right here in this room, you might be facing battles in your own life. And you might have, it might have been a struggle for a while. You might feel like the devil is just one step ahead of you. And that, you know, you're finally going to get back right and then you fall right back down again. And some of us may feel like that we will never be victorious over our circumstances. But I want you to know this morning that you can take heart and you can have faith because God has given a secret weapon to you. He's given us a secret weapon this morning. See, in John 14 and 16, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. A comforter. Something to make you feel at peace within your soul. But not only something to comfort you, in other translations, this is called the helper. It's something that's going to help us fight our battles. Anybody heard that song? That they released not too long ago. This, this is how I fight my battles. Yes. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded. But I'm surrounded by you. Right. It may look like the enemy is surrounding you this morning. But I want you to know that God is in this place. And he's got you right there within his grasp. And he can defeat the enemy at any point in time. Right. So what is the secret weapon? In Acts chapter 1 verse 8. It says, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost part of the earth. Power. 
you shall receive power. And it's power that only comes from God. You can't replicate it. You can't duplicate it. You can't go out to Walmart. You definitely can't go out to Target and buy it. After what's going on with them. Somebody said, you know, if, if y'all are going to boycott one place, you know, you got to boycott the other. There's got to be a line. There's got to be a line. And uh, I tell you what, if they're, I told Casey the other day, she's, you know, if they're partnering up with some kind of satanic organization, that's that's the line for me. They, they put the target on their own back. I would not support that. Not at all. And I was glad to hear that their shares had gone down. Because that gave me hope that, you know what, there's still a country out there that loves Jesus and that loves God. And we need it. And Brother Ian, I know you told me in our meeting Wednesday night that I better be careful what I say on Facebook, but they can shut me down right there all they want to because I'm going to keep on speaking truth and I'm going to keep on preaching the gospel that Jesus has given me. And they can shut it down all they want to. I hate it for everybody else that won't be able to hear it, but you know what? They can come see me right here in Mount Pleasant. We're at 1244 on the road, Crawford, Georgia, and you can come down here and listen to the truth. Because I will not keep my mouth shut. See, I'm just stubborn enough. I'm just stubborn enough that, that you can't keep me quiet sometimes. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to speak what God gives me. You know, that, that word Pentecost. What Pentecost means is 50 days from the Passover. 50 days from the Passover. But if you go back and think about what happened the week of Passover, back in these times, Jesus was crucified. That's what happened. Jesus was crucified and he was risen during that Passover. So this is 50 days now. And on that 50 day, 50th day in Acts 2, verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. See, that's important right there. That we're all in one accord. That we are unified. That we are around people with like-minded faith. We've got one vision, one dream, and we serve one God. That's what's important. It says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. See, what I want you to know right now is it says that it came in like a rushing mighty wind and they began to speak in other tongues. What happened is they became wind talkers. They became wind talkers right there in that upper room. See, they were speaking a language that nobody else might have understood, but God knew exactly what they were saying. They may not have understood what they were saying, but God did. This new language, it was given them to defeat the power of sin and defeat Satan. It was a unique language that Satan could not comprehend or understand. And I want you to know as much as people would like to tell you, it's not nonsense. It's not gibberish. Just like anything, I've seen people, you know, take advantage of it. And, and they, they, they've had classes to, you know, come and we'll teach you how to speak in, you know, in tongues and all that stuff. You can't do that. You know, it's not a different language. You know, you can, you know... I mean, there's there's different stuff. You know, we've heard some of the things over the years. You know, the 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 see my tie, tie my tie. You know, maybe that sounds. You know, uh, the the my my favorite was uh, about the Honda. You know, who stole the keys to my Honda? You know, that's not tongues, guys. You can't teach it. You can't learn it. It's something that's given. It's a gift. The gifting of the Holy Spirit. That's what it is. It's a gift. It's the power of the Holy Ghost speaking through us in a language that the enemy cannot decode. He cannot destroy and he cannot defeat. And here's the greatest thing about it is it brings victory. It brings deliverance. It brings breakthrough. That's what we need. 
How many of y'all have ever been at a point in your life where you needed a breakthrough? Yeah. That you needed God to move in a mighty way? I want you to know this morning that that Holy Ghost will bring breakthrough for you. 1 Corinthians 14 and 2. It says, For one who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands or catches his meaning. Because in the Holy Spirit, he utters secret truths and hidden things not obvious to the understanding. See, we might not understand what we're saying, and it's not our job to understand what we're, staying, what we're saying. Because that's God's language. That's, a lot of people call it the prayer language. Yes. The prayer language. Now, it's very important, and I'm not going to get into this, this too much this morning, and I'll do some teaching on this later, but it is important that we understand that there's two types of tongues. There's the complete unknown tongue, in which only God can understand. And when it is spoken, then what you should begin to do is pray for an interpretation. And then when the interpretation comes, you'll know it. I promise you, I've been in services where this has happened before. And I can feel the atmosphere begin to change. I can feel it. But then there's a, a different tongue to where it's a tongue that's unknown to you. And it may be a tongue that other people understand out in the world, but it's not your tongue. It's a different language. I want you to know that I've been up here before praying and a brother started speaking in tongues at one point in time. And this was when I was in college. And I had taken Spanish in high school with Mr. Lance. Toughest thing I've ever done in my life, I think. It's either that or, uh, you know, having the umpire behind the plate over at the rec department. Um, I'm telling you right now, that's rough too. You know, having those parents right behind you yelling at you. I'm glad, I'm glad they put up that wall that they did. Man, I, I was ready to cast some demons out right there. Mm. But, you know, I, um, I begin to think, you know, that of all those classes that I had taken in Spanish, that I felt like I had gained a pretty good understanding of the language. Um, it took a little while, but I went from high school into college Spanish, and in my college Spanish, I actually, my first semester, I made a 100, um, which is really surprising because I struggled with it, you know, in high school. But what Mr. Lance did was prepare me for college. And then I made a 98. And then I made a 95 on my third Spanish in, in college. I took three semesters of it. Sister Courtney will understand. She understands what I'm saying when I struggle with it. But she had to, she tried to help me study sometimes and it was bad. I had the little flashcards and it just wasn't taken. But I had gained a pretty good understanding of it. I wasn't fluent or anything. But my brother came up here and all of a sudden the spirit fell and he began to speak in tongues. And I could understand exactly what he was saying in Spanish. And I went to ask him, and he was speaking it a lot better than I've ever spoken. Ever. And I asked him, I said, Brother, I said, have you ever taken any Spanish classes or anything? No. And I told him, I said, well, you were speaking fluent Spanish up here. And I understood exactly everything you just said. That's the power of God. That's the power of God. And this isn't something that just, just came about. As I said, this was something that was promised years ago. In Isaiah 28 and 11, it says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. In Acts chapter 2, when this took place, when it took place, it, it began to spill out into the streets. And Everybody began to look at these men and they were like, you know, these men and these women, they said they're, they're going crazy. You know, what, what's going on with them? And they thought they were drunk is what they, they thought. But in Acts 2 and 15, it says, for these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So what did Joel say? I'm glad y'all asked. 
Joel chapter 2, verse 28. This is back in the Old Testament now. Think about it. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. See, this is something that was promised a long time ago that was coming to pass. They were seeing it happen right in front of them. And I can't imagine being there to witness this. See, I love there that it says in Acts chapter 2 or earlier in the chapter, it says that a sound came from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. I love that they called those Navajo people that helped with this coding and stuff that they called them the wind talkers. Because that's the first thing I thought about was that rushing mighty wind. But that Holy Spirit, it came in like a wind. And it's put there to help us, to comfort us, to empower us. And in Romans 8, 26 through 27, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows that the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. See, it's there to overcome our weaknesses. It's there to pick us up when... We're struggling so bad that we don't even have the words. Has anybody been so tore up and you went to go tell somebody, you know, what was going on and all you could do was cry? You couldn't even hardly get any words out. I've been there before. I want you to know that that spirit, that Holy Spirit is there to speak the words that you can't get out. And God will hear it. I promise you. God will hear it. He'll be mindful of it. And see, Jesus, he was trying to comfort his following before he left to let them know that this was going to come. That he was going to send his spirit down. And he was going to comfort us. In John 16 and 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. See, what is comfort? Well, comfort, defined by Webster's Dictionary, is a state of physical ease or freedom from pain or constraint. It's a state of physical ease and freedom from pain or constraint. See, what that tells me right there is that that Holy Spirit, when it comes in, that it can heal different things that have caused you pain over the years. It says pain or constraint, that it can remove the chains that have constrained you and had you bound for years. But you've got to want it to come in. You've got to want to allow it to enter into your life and let it move through every part of you. Because I can go ahead and tell you, once you've experienced it, you'll understand that you've never experienced anything like it before. And it will change your life. It'll change your life. And I want you to know that some of us need a life change. Some of us need to die out to the old person that we've been for so long. And we need to allow God to rebirth us. To bring us back as a new creation. I didn't put these verses in there. And I'm sorry, Wesley, that I don't have them in there. But, you know, when, when, these, when these men and women, they got out from that upper room and they got out in the streets... And the, some of the people said that they, these people are drunk. And Peter told them, he said, these people aren't drunk as you suppose. But this is what was spoken by the prophet of Joel. 
And it says that they begin to ask, well, how is it that we see men speaking in languages they don't know and we hear them speaking in our language? Because see, what you've got to understand is that there were a lot of people that were in Jerusalem from all over. So there were a lot of places represented there to celebrate what the Jewish people call Shabbat. But what we call Pentecost. Because see, that word Shabbat, it means 50 in Hebrew. The word Pentecost means 50 in Greek. And there was actually meaning from that as well. See, what it meant there, calling it Pentecost, is that it wasn't just meant for the Jewish people, but it was meant for the Greek. It was meant for everybody. Everybody. And that was showed later. But when the people saw it, it says that there was a group of people that they began to wonder. It says they were pricked to their heart and they asked this question, what must we do? I preached a, a sermon series on this last, last year called Plan of Action. And see, this is God's plan of action for the church. And the first series, the first part of the series was called, What Must We Do? Because this is what these men and women asked. What must we do to receive what you've got? And Peter told them in Acts 2 and 38, it says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remissions of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Repent, be baptized in Jesus' name for remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's the plan. That's how you can get it. And I want you to know that it's it's not something that was just for them back, back in those times. It's for you. It's for your children. It's for their children. And all generations to come. But there's only one way to get it. And that's through submission to Jesus Christ. And a desire to see God poured into you. And in order for Him to pour it in, you've got to empty yourself. See, that's what it means. Repent. Empty yourself. And then... Cleanse yourself and then you are a proper vessel for him to come and fill into you. Let's stand this morning. I'm going to ask Brother Patrick, do you mind pulling the people over? See, I love there that Jesus called it the Comforter. See, there are so many people that are scared of it. They're scared of the Holy Ghost. They, they, they get scared when people speak in tongues and, you know, it, it just it, it concerns them. I want you to know it's not meant to be scary. And if you ever experience it, you'll understand that it was put there for you. That it was put there to, to help you, to comfort you, and to bring victory and deliverance. In 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. That's the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, same thing. That's what it is. And see, God not only wants to gift you with the Holy Ghost and His Spirit, but He wants you to use that to encourage others. To bring others out of their struggle. To give them comfort when they need it. 
It's important that we look at the wording there. It says, to be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. You know, my, my Bible says that we should, you know, refresh to be refreshed. Along those same lines, we should be comforted so that we can comfort others. We should be strengthened so that we can help strengthen other, others. That's what we're called to do. And I want you to know that God's got victory for you. If you'll let him fight your battle, he's got victory for you. In Deuteronomy 20 and 4, it says, For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you your victory, to give you victory. So he wants to give you that victory this morning. He doesn't want to see you struggle. He doesn't want to see you worried. He doesn't want to see you broken with a sense of defeat. He doesn't want you to walk around with your head on low because you feel like you failed or you missed the mark. See, God's not wanting to, to beat anybody up. What He wants to do is He wants to fill you up. He wants to strengthen you. And He wants to remove every bit of pain that has caused you trouble over the years. He wants to turn you into somebody new. And I promise you this morning that if you'll give it to Him, if you'll give Him your life, if you'll accept His plan of action, then I promise you He's got something great for you. It all starts with us humbling ourselves before Him. See, that's what this altar is here for. It's here to lay all your burdens down right here at His feet. Because see, what I didn't mention is that they were all in that upper room and they were in one place and in one accord. But what we didn't read was what they were doing up in the upper room. And that's praying. They were praying they were waiting on God to move. They were waiting on His promise. So if God hasn't moved yet, we mentioned this the other day, but if God hasn't moved yet, keep on praying. Keep on pushing. Yes. Pushing. Push. Pray until something happens. Yes. And in God's time, I promise you, He'll bring you exactly what He's promised you. Will you be obedient this morning? Will you be courageous this morning and take back what the enemies tried to steal from you? See, God wants to restore somebody's joy in here this morning. God wants to do a work in somebody's life this morning. And if we'll put ourselves in front of Him, He'll do something great. It takes one step out from that pew down here to this altar and it can change your life forever. God wants to do it this morning. Do you want Him to do it? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank You for Your Word. God, I thank You for Your outpouring of the Spirit all those years ago on the day of Pentecost. But God, we want Your Spirit to be poured out in this place right now. God, You know the needs that are in this house. God, you know the hearts. God, you know the minds. You know what people are struggling with. God, I pray right now that just like on that day of Pentecost, God, I pray that hearts would begin to be pricked in this place. And God, I pray that you would just give us the courage to come down to this old-fashioned altar and lay all of our burdens right down at your feet so you can turn us into something new. So you can remove all the weight, all the pain, all the constraint that's been there. And you can do a mighty work in us. God, I pray for a fresh anointing to be in this place. A fresh anointing of the Holy Ghost in this house this morning. And God,
God, I thank you for what you're about to do in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. These altars are open. If anybody wants to spend some time in prayer, if anybody wants to come give him something, to lay it down, come and do it right now. Thank you.